So I've got to address two questions very quickly in the next 15 minutes to allow time for discussion. So I'm going to do it. The first question is, why did it take so long for the populist backlash to happen? Financial crisis starts in 2008. I'd actually been puzzled by the lack of populism before the financial crisis because I was looking at the impact of Chinese competition on American manufacturing and the communities that uh, were employed by American manufacturing. And I was like, where are the populists? Where is the protectionism? It's one of the first questions I remember asking my political science colleagues at Harvard shortly after I'd moved there in 2006. The most recent book, The Square and the Tower, offers an answer to that question, which I'll briefly summarize. It is not the case, I think, that we can explain 2016 with the word Russia. Much as uh, certain segments of the media would like to do it. I do think that we can explain it with the word Facebook, or more broadly with social media. And one of the arguments that I make in the book, and I'll make it very briefly here, is that there had been a profound change in the nature of the American public sphere, say, between 2008 and 2016, that most political commentators underestimated because they did not realize how profoundly social media had changed the game. They should, in fact, have noticed in 2012 when already the Obama campaign was using Facebook data, but most people missed that. They did not appreciate its importance. The argument of the book is that by creating a global network, uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, had not, in fact, created one world. They'd created engines of polarization, illustrated nicely here. Political Twitter essentially creates two different clusters, uh, liberals who retweet liberals and conservatives who retweet conservatives, and there's very little retweet activity across the political divide. The new ecosystem of social media was extraordinarily susceptible to fake news stories in a way that traditional media were not, because traditional media paid people to screen out untrue stories. Uh, because the network platforms make money on the basis of user engagement, they, as you doubtless know, uh, essentially calibrated their algorithms to promote sensational stories regardless of whether they were true or not. And this was my favorite, the, the untrue story that the Pope had endorsed uh, Donald Trump. It's true that the Russians used Facebook and Twitter to spread fake news, and all of these images were Russian in origin, and uh, it's clear that a great many Americans saw images like this. My favorite is, Satan, if I win, Clinton wins. Jesus, not if I can help it. Press like to help Jesus win. <laughs> I love the idea of somebody sitting in St. Petersburg just dreaming that up, <laughs> kind of laughing madly and having another shot of vodka. But fascinating though this is, and uh, Important work's been done on this by uh, our relatively new colleague here at Stanford, uh, René de Resta. The key thing is that as a proportion of all the internet content about the election in 2016, the Russians accounted for less than 1%. I mean, they did a great job with $100,000 and 470 false identities. They ran a bunch of ads on Facebook and Instagram, and they were seen by almost as many Americans as voted, though not necessarily the same Americans. But if you look at what Americans were generating uh, about politics on social media in the same time frame, it's vastly more, like 10 billion Facebook and other social media posts. Uh, so the Russians basically accounted for less than 1% of the content. And that's why I say you can't explain 2016 by saying Russia. If the Russians had just stayed home and concentrated on, on playing video games and done nothing, I don't think it would have made any 
difference because there was enough going on on social media to have this kind of result. Trump dominated Clinton on the major platforms. You can see it here on Twitter and on Facebook. He was far ahead. He also, also was far ahead in Google search. Notice also, if you go back to 2008, it's kind of like unimportant. By 2016, this had become really important. And I think the correct conclusion is the one that Brad Pascal, Trump's digital media director, drew. These social platforms are all invented by very liberal people on the West and East Coasts, and we figure out how to use it to push conservative values. I don't think they thought that would ever happen. I think that nails it. You could hear the heads exploding within uh, a few miles of this campus when the result of the election came out. Both at Google and at Facebook, they could not believe it. Depressing black turnout was very important. When people say race wasn't a factor, it was all economics, I think that misunderstands what happened. Race was a factor in one specific way. A concerted effort was made by Trump supporters and indeed by the Trump campaign to depress black turnout, and it worked. This is the single biggest difference between 2012 and 2016 when you run the numbers. And it almost certainly was the decisive difference. And this was part of what the Facebook ads run by the Trump campaign were designed to achieve. That's, I think, now pretty clear. But here's the final point I want to make. What if this is all just a brief four-year interlude? What if populism, as was true in the late 19th century, turns out to have a short half-life. I'm not saying that I find any of the people on this slide profoundly impressive, but I am saying that it is by no means clear that President Trump will be re-elected next year. Here's why I think that. The polarization that has happened in the American electorate, which predates the financial crisis. You can see here, if you just look at uh, these interesting numbers, white women with bachelor's degrees are way to the left, uh, and white men without bachelor's degrees are way to the right, relative to the 1990s when they were basically in the same place on the political spectrum. I think that's not going to change. I think what is really striking is the generational divide that has opened up and this is where you will be able to give me insights. It is very striking that Generation Z particularly, but also millennials, are to the left of older voters on most issues. And this generational divide is more striking in the United States than it is in any European country, except possibly the UK. Generation X plus millennials plus Generation Z will be 62% of the electorate next year, roughly. And of course, that proportion will rise steadily as we go forward to 2024 and 2028. The Grim Reaper is going to be working for the Democrats uh, in the coming years, taking senior voters away from the Republican uh, side. The left is so, the, the young are so to the left these days that amongst uh, age groups, the only one that prefers socialism to capitalism is the demographic 18 to 24. And I'm sure all of you are representative of that demographic. Otherwise, why would you be here at the Hoover Institution? You came here to have your minds changed about socialism. What do your contemporaries care about? The data are really, really clear. Relative to other age groups, the young, and this is looking here at 18 to 29, are for single-payer health care, for tuition-free college, for a federal jobs guarantee. They're not that bothered about powerful labor movements. They care about those things on the left of the slide. They want a bigger role for government. This is really striking if you compare Gen Z uh, with the oldest generation in the population, the so-called silence, people even older than me, uh, 
government should do more to solve problems. Government has a responsibility to guarantee health care to all. The younger you are in America, the more you believe those things. The other amazing thing about your generation, and I'll say your generation, assuming most people belong to Gen Z or, or, or millennials, is that they or you are not very liberal. Yashka Monk has done some interesting work on this across countries uh, where the proportion of the uh, population or the age group that regards democracy uh, as an essential political system is quite worryingly uh, low. And finally, it won't perhaps come as a surprise to you that the younger generation is illiberal on the question of free speech. Uh, some recent survey data uh, is quite striking on this point, where something like three quarters of the respondents, uh, students basically think that colleges should establish policies that restrict uh, various forms of free speech uh, on campus. Uh, using slurs or other language that's intentionally offensive, wearing costumes that stereotype certain racial or ethnic groups, expressing political viewpoints that are upsetting or offensive to certain groups. This generational divide is extremely important because it contains the future of American politics. And that future may not come next year, but I think it comes pretty inexorably in the subsequent decade. A critical point to note is that in the social media arms race, there is nothing to stop the populists of the left learning from the populists of the right. And that is why it's so interesting that AOC and indeed Bernie Sanders have become very effective on social media, uh, far more than the earlier generation uh, of Democrats. I think, therefore, that this is a possible future in maybe not a year, maybe five years, but it is a possible future. And that would not be a historically surprising outcome, and this is my final point, because the lesson of history is that populists are nearly always followed by progressives. The populist wave of the 1870s that produced the Exclusion Act of 1882 burned out and was pretty much over. They couldn't get a populist elected back then, despite William Jennings Bryan's three attempts. And ultimately, progressivism took over, as all of you who've done 19th and early 20th century American political history know. But that wasn't just true in the United States. It was true more or less everywhere in the Western world, that after 1900, the pendulum swung to the left, so that most of the leaders who were in power by 1914 were, in fact, liberals rather than conservatives. There's an irony here. And it's the last point I'm going to make. Often when people are beating up on Trump, uh, they make the argument that not only is he a, a fascist, but the probability of war goes up when such people are in power. This is quite wrong. It's progressives, historically, who get the United States into big wars. The Bush administration, George W. Bush's administration, was the exception to this rule. All the major wars of the 20th century uh, had Democrats at the helm when the United States became involved in them. Uh, I could have added Truman if I'd wanted to include Korea. When you're applying history, and you should do this as a systematic part of your approach to life, remember that history will produce surprising answers and often answers that are at odds with what you're hearing on the mainstream media or reading uh, in the New York Times. Populists are not into war, and I suspect that Donald Trump will prove to be no exception to this rule. What populists tend to say is, what the hell are we doing in these countries I can't find on the damn map? Bring the troops back home. That's clearly Trump's impulse. I'll be very surprised if Trump involves the United States in a major military conflict. You can come back next year and beat me up if I turn out to be wrong about that. It's actually Democrats, I might even say progressive Democrats, who are drawn into conflicts. Uh, and this is one of the ironies of history and one of the things that make studying history fun. 
if anybody's going to get the United States in a war with China, it'll be President Warren. Mark my words. Thank you very much indeed.